screen now, right? Did I stop sharing? There we go, good. Um, and here I'd like to just introduce our guests today, Chuck and Nancy Bell, who moved here fairly recently. Uh, and over the past 15 years, Nancy and Chuck have traveled the world uh, over for nature photography. They started out on birding trips, but with the advent of digital cameras, Nancy also started carrying camera gear. And when they had reached bird life lists of over 5,800 species, Chuck also got camera gear. And since then they have traveled for nature photography, focusing on living creatures wherever they go. Their appreciation for the natural world has been honed by their awareness of the critical need for conservation as the impact of human beings overwhelms the earth. And this is what they will focus on this morning. Um, so thank you so much. Chuck and Nancy, I hand it over to you. Um, thank you very much for being with us. Okay, well, thank you very much, Christine. Let me uh, just bring this thing up, hold on. Runs a little slow here while we're sharing screen. There we go, okay. Wow. Coming up, wait a minute, <laughs> there we go, okay. Yeah. Let me just make sure. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's a little, a little one. That one. Yeah. That's okay. it. Okay. Good. All right. <laughs> so let me get that out of here. Move it up. Okay. So the question is, what are we really talking about here? And you know, our title is "Declining Species Around the World," but what we're really talking about is not how so many species are declining, but how the one species, and that's us, is really impacting everybody else. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know, we've got to think of it in that context. And I hope, you know, if you take anything away from this presentation today, I hope it's that. And, uh, uh, if you look at some of the, you know, what's happened to the population and using 1950 as a baseline, which is when I was eight years old, look at the world population has tripled, the US population has doubled, the Africa population has increased by five times, and the Asian population has tripled. I mean, those are enormously rapid growths of any species on Earth. Now, the other thing uh, that I want to just as a preface here to talk about, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the International Union of Conservation of Nature uh, Red List of Threatened Species. And they basically have five categories and scientists all over the world feed into this database and somewhere along the way, the determinations are made of what kind of uh, uh, you know, threat level should be assigned to a species. And that's based not so much on the numbers of the species that exist right now, but on the how rapidly it is declining and how serious the threats are. And when I first started putting this program together, I thought, well, we'll do the first four, uh, critically endangered, endangered, vulnerable, and near threatened. But as I got into it, I realized if I kept near threatened uh, as pictures as well, uh, we'd be here until three or four o'clock this afternoon. <laughs> we, we have photographed so many around the world. Uh, almost every time you point a camera at something, it's got, a, it's got a, a, an endangered uh, classification to it or many times. So anyway, uh, what you'll see today is the, uh, our what we have photographed in terms of the first top three uh, endangered species and categories uh, in various places around the world. And mind you, we haven't been everywhere, but uh, it's, uh, I was actually dumbfounded by the numbers of endangered species when I really started looking at what we had photographed. So let's start with Africa. I lived there for about 15 years. Uh, and um, that's sort of the continent I know best besides North America, I guess. So we'll start with Africa. 
And I think you've all heard about the black rhino. Uh, it's critically endangered. Uh, its numbers dropped by 98% because of poaching for its horn for use in medicinal purposes in Asia and dagger handles in Yemen and so on. Uh, it's doing a little better than it did thanks to conservation efforts of which I am proud to have been involved in in Zimbabwe uh, when I lived there in the 1980s. But uh, uh, anyway, the, they're up to about 5,600 uh, animals today and hopefully uh, won't get any lower than that. This one's an interesting one. The Rupel's griffin vulture is critically endangered as well. And one of the interesting things about it is that some tribal people feel that it's a bird of wisdom and if they kill it and feed it to their children, their children will be wise. Several years ago, we were in Southern Ethiopia, actually on a birding trip, but Nancy was carrying her camera with her. <laughs> and uh, we went to the far South, which I don't think is safe to go to anymore. Uh, I know the North is either, but uh, we uh, went specifically looking for the Sidamo lark or the Liban lark as it's also known. And uh, it's uh, uh, one of the most critically endangered species on earth. There's only about 200 of them that remain. And uh, Nancy managed to get this photograph of it, which uh, is uh, really exceptional. This, I, I went to the Br British bird watching fair in 2010, and this bird was their bird of the, the, the festival, of the fair, and they raised 250,000 pounds uh, for its uh, habitat protection. And I think that's helped make a difference in trying to save this species. We also all know about the mountain gorilla and how it's being impacted by uh, habitat loss and trophy hunting and uh, particularly the civil unrest that's taking place in the uh, mountains of East Africa. And the African wild dog is endangered. Its numbers have dropped 100 times. These are puppies. We were fortunate to see these on the outskirts of Kruger National Park in South Africa. But we've also been actually fairly fortunate in seeing the packs of wild dogs in various places around Africa where we've been, but that they're still, they're very, very scarce. And they are terrible hunters. They're incredibly effective. Another canid in Africa, and this one's interesting, particularly in terms of climate change. Uh, the uh, Ethiopian wolf lives at altitudes above 15,000 feet. Now, mm -hmm. mind you, the highest mountain in the lower 48 is 14,300 in Colorado, Mount Elbert. And, uh, uh, and this uh, little, uh, the Ethiopian wolf lives above that altitude. And what's happening with climate change is that uh, people can raise cattle higher and higher up the mountains. And with cattle come their dogs, their domestic dogs. And the dogs bring distemper and rabies and other canine diseases. And they interbreed with these Ethiopian wolves. So it is, it is really uh, declining. And I don't know that it's going to survive with the press, population pressures of Ethiopia are, are just incredible. Right? We've done a good job keeping people alive, but we haven't taught them how to, how to uh, do any family planning. That's another picture of it. Another Ethiopian bird, the specimen's bush crow, uh, endangered species, not unusual for Ethiopia. Then uh, down in Kenya, we photographed the uh, reticulated the Somali giraffe. Uh, one doesn't think of giraffes as being endangered, but uh, uh, there are several species of giraffe, and at least three of them are, including the uh, uh, Maasai giraffe as well. 
which we photographed in Kenya. Also in Kenya, the Grevy zebra, uh, its stripes are much narrower. There's many more stripes on the side of an animal than there are on a, on a, a virtual zebra, which I think most of you see in, you know, uh, it's common zebra pictures, but uh, the Grevy's, there's only about 2,500 left. And we photographed these in Meru National Park in Kenya. lapid faced vultures, you see them on kills, you know, lion kills and so on around Africa, but there's not that many left. There's only 5,700, according to, uh, and, and again, people hunt them for medicine like they do for the Rupert's Griffin. And climate change is affecting the secretary bird. Uh, drier habitats, fewer insects, fewer food, you know, less food, and also uh, less habitat as uh, people expand their, you know, their population and particularly running cattle and eating up the vegetation that harbors the insects for it. This is to me is the most beautiful bird in the world. Uh, people could argue that compared to the birds of paradise of Papua New Guinea and so on, but it's, uh, it's really elegant. Um, and again, it's, uh, you know, it's numbers, if you look at 20,000, you say, oh, well, that's pretty good. But its habitat is being very dramatically uh, uh, overrun by people and also by climate change. On the west coast of South Africa, just uh, north of Cape Town, uh, we visited the uh, Gannett colony up there, the Cape Gannett. And then also uh, in that same area, we saw the the Cape Cormorant, both of these are endangered by commercial overfishing largely. Uh, and also they're uh, vulnerable for sea level rise. The, particularly this Gannet colony, which probably had several thousand birds in it. Uh, it's one of the few nesting colonies that the, these Gannets have. And it wasn't that far above sea level that, you know, you get a rise in sea level in a big storm and you could just wipe out that the whole year's nests. Uh, again, in South Africa, the uh, and the Cape, uh, the African penguin, uh, it's down to about 41,000 individuals. Uh, and its Persane fisheries seem to be wiping out its a good part of its near shore feeding. And uh, also some just generally, the ocean currents are changing and the fish that they need to depend on are, are being pushed out and uh, further. Going way up on the other end of Africa in Morocco, uh, this bird was down almost to extinction and it's been brought back uh, to uh, about 250 birds. We saw it in Southern Morocco. It actually used to live in Spain as well, but, uh, and I think they're trying to reintroduce a small population there so they don't have all their eggs in one basket, but uh, it's, uh, it's gonna be, uh, uh, touch and go for this species. Moving on to the vulnerable category, the lions. Uh, one doesn't think of a lion of being endangered, but look at the numbers from 400,000 down to 20,000. Elephants, the same way, they're vulnerable. Drought, climate change, and poaching for ivory. Uh, I don't know whether that 38,000 is a current number or not. I would hope it's lower than that, but uh, uh, it's not that long ago. They were losing about 38,000 elephants a year. And again, another one, the cheetah. Uh, it's an incredibly beautiful animal, but it's kind of a loner. And uh, these are cubs waiting for mama to return with the kill. It was listed as vulnerable in 2015. I don't think it's been reevaluated since then. I think it should be elevated to endangered status. You look at how much, I mean, it's gone down 50 times. It's a beautiful animal. 
and going back to Ethiopia, um, the uh, uh, up there in the same area where that Ethiopian wolf lives is this uh, Walia ibex. And uh, again, it's very vulnerable to climate change uh, as cattle move up the mountain and people move up the mountain as it gets warmer. And also they uh, 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 are, you know, suffering from cattle disease and things like that. So it, it, I think it should be endangered as well. Two birds in uh, that part of the world, the Prince Ruspoli's Turaco. Interesting story, Prince Ruspoli uh, was an early uh, Italian ornithologist in, or adventurer really, but with an ornithological interest in uh, the early 1900s. And he described this bird and uh, in his notes, but he was trampled to death by an elephant later on his trip. And all they had was his notes, and it took him several decades to relocate this bird. Uh, and now it's it's fairly widespread, but it's sparse wherever it is, so it is vulnerable. And so is the uh, Somali ostrich, a little different from the regular ostrich. And would notice that bright tail that it's got. And of course, the shoebill, uh, just a incredible be beautiful animal. We spent a whole day in a canoe outside of Kampala, Uganda, looking for this species in a place where you were 100% guaranteed to find it, and we didn't. <laughs> we later saw it as we were farther north in Uganda, and uh, Nancy got this picture. <laughs> Going to Madagascar, the home of the critically endangered species. Almost all of its lemurs are critically endangered because of habitat loss. Just again, population explosion on Madagascar. They've cut all the forests, and uh, it's it, it, the 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 injury is my favorite because of this. I hope you all heard that. It's uh, a really mournful cry. It's actually a territorial call, but uh, it hardly needs to worry about having its, you know, territory invaded by other other uh, injuries because there's not so many left anymore. You know. Whoops! I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> Somehow I got to get rid of that. <laughs> there we go. Okay. <laughs> There's another one, the Vero Sifaka is listed as critically endangered. And uh, uh, it's really amusing when to watch it run across a road. Uh, it's basically an arboreal animal and you can see how its feet are made for gripping uh, tree limbs and not running on the ground. But when it wants to cross from one patch of forest to another, this is how it does it. And this is one of the most endangered of the Sifaka species. It's declined 80%. Not just lemurs there, but tortoises. And this one has been a victim of people catching it for the pet trade, uh, but also habitat loss. And of course, lemurs again. Here's Nancy with uh, uh, a few lemurs climbing all over. This was in a sanctuary in Madagascar. I mean, they're basically living wild, but they are protected in this sanctuary and they obviously are fed uh, because that's why they seem to love people. And this critter preys on lemurs. That's its principal food. Uh, it's not really, it's, I guess it's closer to a cat than it is to a dog, but uh, it's almost, it's really a, you know, a species totally of a family and all unto itself and it's classed as vulnerable. It's pronounced fossa. South Asia, India, the tiger, of course, very famous. Uh, it was almost hunted to extinction 
until Indira Gandhi became prime minister, and it is their national animal. And uh, she established a whole bunch of parks and reserves around India to protect this species and many of the others in India, fortunately, and its numbers have rebounded from about 1400 to somewhere maybe close to uh, close to getting close to 4000 now. But interestingly, there's more in uh, captivity in the United States than uh, in the wild in India. Another, I was really fortunate to just snap a picture of this guy when he popped up out of the water for a few seconds. It's a garile and it's lost 98% of its riverbank habitat. And one recent count put its numbers at only 157. It's like a crocodile or an alligator, but look at that snout. Another canid. Canids all over the world have a hard time. Uh, this one is endangered, only about 2,500 remain. Again, habitat loss, uh, diseases spread by domestic dogs. And uh, it used to roam all over Asia, Europe, and North America. The dole. There's a lot of elephants in captivity in Asia, the Asian elephant, but it's, uh, uh, it's really endangered in the wild. There's not that many left simply because there's not that much habitat for them. Those elephants need large uh, pieces of habitat to exist and uh, it's been reduced so much by human population growth. In India's Western Ghats, which is sort of a, a, an area, it's, I mean, it's in the Southwest corner of India, but it's, uh, it's almost a, a unique ecosystem by itself and has a lot of its own sort of specialized species. One of these is the Nilgiri Tar. The Nilgiri is a mountain chain there, it means blue mountains in uh, whatever language they speak in Western, uh, Southwestern India but its numbers have dwindled tremendously and it's in danger. This one was the first bird discovered, new species discovered in Sri Lanka since uh, 1868. And there's not very many of them, and, uh, but our guides knew where this one, one territory was. And we stood around and we listened for it and we heard it. And we scrambled up this hill, uh, uh, Nancy going uh, literally hand over, just crawling up the hill, hands and feet, and got herself into position. And Pete poked her camera through a little hole in the foliage and got this picture. And it's probably the, one of the very best pictures that was ever taken. It was Sarah Dibb stops out. And we saw this, what, about three years ago? Uh, when we were in Sri Lanka. Uh, again, in uh, Western Ghats, uh, two species that are endangered, habitat loss again. Sri Lanka has several rare endemic species, including the uh, dry zone tok macaque. And the bonnet macaque of Southern India. And uh, up in Kazaranga National Park, it's a refuge for the Indian one-horned rhino. But it's been brought back from the brink of extinction to about 3,500 animals. Uh, it was uh, really uh, wonderful to get up close to these animals. Really incredible. And one that you wouldn't think of, but uh, uh, it's one of the wild cattle species that remains on earth. Uh, and uh, it's declined 70% in three generations. It's been hunted for meat. It's had habitat loss and, of course, cattle diseases transmitted. The cows roam all over, domestic cows roam all over India, and uh, uh, they uh, tend to spread disease to this species. But it is in some protected areas in India where cattle, were, you know, cattle are not allowed, and uh, it's doing 
it's stable there, I guess. So, the Barasinga means a 12 horned uh, deer. It's the only deer in India that has South Asia that has more than three times it is vulnerable to extinction because of habitat loss. Now, we don't always get good pictures. This is the best I could get of a sloth bear. <laughs> we tried so hard to get this species and we just never were where it was when it popped out. But again, it's a vulnerable uh, uh, critter and uh, lives primarily in India. There's a few in Sri Lanka as well. And the Nilgiri Pipit in the Mindogiri Mountains there and also the lesser adjutant. It's a huge bird, just incredibly large, bigger, much bigger than our great blue heron. Malabar gray hornball, hornbill in uh, southwestern India. Uh, people don't really know why it's declining other than you know, generally habitat loss, but it's also declining in protected areas. The great hornbill or great pied hornbill we've seen in Thailand and we've seen here in India. Um, I'm not sure whether we saw it in Bhutan or not, but anyway, it's it's a, a beautiful, incredible bird, but again, vulnerable. Borneo, like Madagascar, is just being devastated by development, and it's an area of endemism. The Bornean pig, pygmy elephant is endangered. There's only about 1,500 left. We were very lucky to see this group come down to the river when we were in a boat and or watched them cross right in front of us. And of course, the orangutan everybody knows about. Uh, it's being devastated by the fact that the forests are being cut for palm oil plantations. If you realize how much of what you use every day has palm oil as an ingredient, it's almost scary when you go to a place like Borneo or New Caledonia and you see how the forests have just been totally replaced by palm oil plantations for cosmetics and soap and whatever. This baby is actually three years old. They, they don't grow very fast. They're more like humans. And uh, it takes uh, it takes quite a long time before they leave their mother. I think it's seven, seven years or nine years, mm -hmm, something like exactly. that. Yeah. The, again, another primate the mother's given has suffered uh, from habitat loss. And so are birds like the white crowned hornbill. This guy is just, I love him, the proboscis monkey, but he's been reduced by half in 50 years. There's only about 7,000 of them left. But you'd never know it, the bliss on this guy's face. By the way, let me see if I can go back. Can I, no, I guess I can. Yeah, I can. This guy is more attractive than the other one. Uh, the ladies, like guys with big noses. <laughs> Pigtailed macaque, another vulnerable species in Borneo. And the long-tailed macaque as well. Smooth-coated otter. Nancy got this picture. It's really it's an award-winning picture, this one. and the rhinoceros hornbill and the Bordean tarsier. How big is the tar tarsier dancing about? Oh, about the size of a beer can. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's um, the smallest primate. It's, it's a primate and um, nocturnal. Yeah. The red leaf monkey declining and listed as vulnerable. Beautiful, beautiful little monkey. It's quite a small one. And this little baby, 
silvery leaf monkey. Put in, we saw him on peninsular Malaysia. We were at a refuge and uh, uh, these monkeys were hanging around the, the headquarters and Nancy sat out on the floor to photograph him and he just crawled right up to her camera and looked inside. <laughs> Again, another area that one wouldn't necessarily think about, but Northern Japan, Hokkaido uh, in the winter and the red crowned crane. Uh, and there's a flock that uh, winters there and they actually feed it to protect it. And then it goes north into Siberia to breed in the summer. Uh, but apparently, uh, according to Chinese biologists, the winter range in China is only 8% of what it was uh, in 1980, 40 years ago. There's only 1,830 of them that remain. And this bird is the largest owl in the world, the Blakiston's fish owl. And uh, we uh, went to a special place in Hokkaido where uh, it's known to be uh, along a stream, but it suffers from habitat loss due to forest clearing along waterways and industrial development. Basically, its, it's home range is uh, northern Japan and uh, Siberia, western or eastern Siberia, I should say. You can see it's a banded bird. <clears throat> it's got a fish in its talon. And this bird is just, we got these from a boat out on the ice floes. We were traveling among the ice floes there. Stellar sea eagle and it's vulnerable. Again, uh, it's a resident of Northern Japan and the Kuril Islands and uh, on Western or Eastern Siberia. But overfishing, destroying its food source and industrial development where it breeds and so on. But it's, a, it's an incredibly beautiful bird. Huge too, very large. As big as our bald eagle, if not bigger. New Caledonia, island endemics. The Kegu is being basically, they try to preserve it in some national parks there. And uh, uh, interesting that two dogs killed half of all the radio tagged individuals in two months in the park that where we were actually, where we got this, Nancy got this picture of, uh, uh, and it destroyed over 75% of the families. And that we were there probably in 2014, 2015. So uh, these birds might've been among the victims of the, uh, of the wild dogs, but uh, really an amazing bird to Kegu. Stands about, uh, Probably two feet tall. It's a good, good sized bird. And off New Caledonia is the, the islands of Uvea. And again, uh, there's a parakeet that lives there that doesn't live anywhere else. And it's vulnerable, uh, particularly for pet, uh, being captured for the pet trade. But also, we, that's one area where we saw just most of the Uvea Island is now palm oil plantation. There's very little for native forest left. Hawaii, 45% of the endangered species of the United States, and it gets only 4% of our federal endangered species funding. I don't think that's changed over the years. I've tried to check it out, and it doesn't seem to be much better than it was uh, you know, several years ago. Palia, uh, an endangered, critically endangered species that lives only up on the higher slopes in the big, the big island of Hawaii. Cattle grazing, it's, you know, the big cattle area, the big cattle ranches in Hawaii and it destroyed its habitat. This bird is incredible. You look at the, its, its beak, lower mandible is very short at the top. One is very long for probing insects out of bark, uh, the Akio Palau, and it's endangered. 
uh, we'll talk a little bit about climate change as it, Hawaii gets warmer with, with global warming. The avian mosquito, which actually came, it's an introduced species, the, the, I'm sorry, the mosquito, which is uh, 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 introduced to Hawaii, is uh, in, uh, brought in avian malaria. And it can only, it needs warm temperatures. So it's basically traditionally was lower down in the lower areas of Hawaii. And so the the native Hawaiian birds tend to migrate, you know, you know, live higher and higher up the mountains. But as the global warming takes place and the temperatures get higher, get warmer, the higher up you go, uh, the uh, avian, the mosquito has gone higher and higher. So it's putting these birds at a, a real risk. And, and, you know, many, so, there's a few of the native species that seem to be resistant to it, but most of them succumb to avian malaria. And I don't know that that's, you know, if global warming continues, uh, these birds may all go extinct. The Pacific green turtle or the green turtle is uh, endangered. It actually roams throughout the world's oceans. I think we have them here in Florida as well. But uh, there's intentional harvest of eggs and development along coasts. And, all kinds of other impacts of uh, uh, human population growth. This bird surprised me when I was looking up what's endangered and what isn't in Hawaii. Uh, we thought it was kind of a trash bird because it was introduced, but <laughs> Hawaii is one of its last strongholds. It's uh, uh, decimated by the pet trade, the Java sparrow. Now, I think this is Hawaii's most beautiful bird, the Iibi. Um, it's vulnerable to extinction again, and so is the Eli Pau. And this coot looks very much like our coots, but it's a separate species, and like everything else in Hawaii, it's vulnerable. This bird was brought back from literally almost the brink of extinction uh, through a captive breeding program, and now we saw them in several places around Hawaii. So it's it's their uh, national their state bird, but they're all banded and carefully taken care of. <clears throat> South America, the giant anteater. This one is endangered. Uh, the giant river otter. You can actually just almost hear him crunch on that scaly fish. Darwin's fox down in Chile, uh, uh, impacted by uh, uh, domestic dogs and the diseases they carry. And the giant ant eater is considered vulnerable due to habitat loss. Only about 5,000 left. Two birds of the forest of Ecuador, both vulnerable. The giant ant pit, it looks like a football. It's a good Super Bowl bird. <laughs> I don't know whether he's getting ready to play for the Bucks or not. <clears throat> and uh, we uh, were there uh, just you know, two years ago, just before the pandemic, I guess, uh, to do the main wolf in uh, Brazil, northeastern Brazil. There's an area there where they're relatively reliable. and. Uh, Beautiful long legged, legged creature. But again, habitat loss and disease spread by dogs. The giant taper, we didn't really expect to see this, but it crossed the road in front of us down in uh, southern Brazil, down in southern Pantanal. And uh, uh, I managed to get this shot. I quick jumped out of the car and ran up the hill and photographed it as it was charging into the, into the woods managed to get this shot. And this, of course, is the, one of the most beautiful birds, the hyacinth macaw. And uh, it's, it's been brought back from almost extinction, uh, partly by cattle ranchers in the Pantanal who have realized they can make money off bird tourism if they protected this species. And so they built accommodation and uh, dining halls and so on 
and there are a fair number of birders uh, and photographers go down to the Pantanal uh, to, uh, to meet the jaguar for one, and uh, uh, and then uh, also stop and stay in these ranches and photograph the hyacinth macaw. Island endemics again. The magnificent waved albatross is critically endangered. It breeds only on one Galapagos Island, and it's affected by temperature changes from global warming. The giant tortoise and the, and the giant and the Galapagos sea lion are endangered. The tortoise and there's different species that live on the different islands of the Galapagos, but most of them are endangered. And the Galapagos penguin is not doing well at all. Uh, apparently, El Nino, warmer waters, are impacting its food source, and uh, uh, it's it's not doing well. It's the farthest north penguin species. Again, flightless cormorant, uh, climate change, and the El Ninos are having a hard uh, impact on its food source. And lava gulls, interesting, they are being caught as bycatch. South Polar, I, I know I'm running slow on time here. I'm going to keep going quickly here, but uh, Hooker's sea lion endangered. Gray headed albatross endangered. Northern royal albatross breeds only in New Zealand. The southern royal albatross and the wandering both vulnerable. Two penguin species that we photographed that are vulnerable. Coming to North America, the Atlantic puffin is endangered. <clears throat> Beautiful bird. And the whooping crane, its latest population update is 80 birds. I got that from last September, actually. Uh, 80 birds, 17 are wild hatched, and the rest are captive. It's weird. So I think these guys both may be uh, wild because there's no bands on the adult. Obviously, the juvenile is, but uh, uh, I wonder if the adult isn't wild as well. And of course, here in Florida, we all know about the manatee and it's endangered. There's only about 6,500 that live uh, to be, uh, between Florida and Puerto Rico. And in Colorado, two species of rosy finch, again, climate change causing forests to creep up the mountains and destroying its tundra habitat both the black capped and brown capped rosy finches. And the uh, golden cheek warbler endangered in uh, Texas, outside of Austin. Interestingly, Ross Perot, uh, as soon as Bill Clinton was elected president, Ross Perot owned a big chunk of territory for this bird. And he went in there, and sent people in with chainsaws because he wanted to develop it. And is this the fate of the polar bear? These are not grizzlies. These are polar bears. And they're muddy. And you just wonder if that's what they're going to be faced with. These birds or these bears are muddy. Considered threatened by the US Fish and Wildlife Service, only vulnerable by IUCN. But uh, I suspect that with climate change, it's going to be elevated to endangered species pretty quickly. And the caribou is, you know, we talk about development in the, you know, oil exploration in the Alaska National Wildlife Refuge. And that's the, one of the few remaining habitats for the caribou. And it's considered vulnerable. The snowy owl. I was really lucky to get this picture in Saskatchewan. That is not a doctored photo. That is the real moon behind a real bird. <laughs> and, uh, 
22,000 birds. There's the male, that other one was the female. And of course the Florida scrub jay, you guys all know about this. A uh, lot of efforts to save its habitat. I think they're making some headway with it. Horned grebe. And the long-tailed duck. It's, Main breeding place is the Baltic, actually, and uh, and it's uh, um, it's suffered from uh, uh, being caught in fisheries. Two more birds. One I didn't know about the evening grosbeak. We used to have them in our garden in uh, uh, in Colorado in the mountains, and uh, nobody knows why it's declining so rapidly, but it is. And the black-legged kittiebird. Good question, huh? When this kid grows up, what's he gonna see? That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let me ask uh, if you'd like anyone who'd like to ask a question. Is there anyone there who uh, has a question for Chuck and Nancy? I think, uh, are people able to unmute themselves, Peter? Okay. All you need to do is hit your space bar. Oh, no. great. That was an amazing display. I, we, of all the places you visited, did you have mm -hmm. a favorite? Is the one you would most like to return to? My favorite is Namibia in Southwest Africa. I, uh, that's the most beautiful country I've ever been in. And one of the few places without a whole lot of people, <laughs> it's, uh, you could go a long way in Namibia. <laughs> not <see anybody. laughs> my, my friend, Harvey Lyford, who I see on the screen here, uh, was the American public affairs officer at the U.S. Embassy in Windhoek. And Harvey and I, uh, I flew over the Windhoek in 1990. Uh, and helped Harvey out when the Namibian independence took place. And we had a visit from the American Secretary of State, the whole hosts of journalists. And uh, uh, so Harvey and I have known each other from there. And also before that, we were, I was in Norway and he was in Denmark. <laughs> so, yeah. <clears throat> you. All your pictures are uh, just absolutely amazing. What kind of lenses did you use? Well, we actually we've shifted the last few years from Canon to uh, Sony. Uh, the the uh, Sony mirrorless we like, but uh, a lot of these we took with uh, either three hundred or uh, five hundred millimeter telephoto lenses, and we're pretty much using now we're using the uh, uh, Sony. 100 to 400 and the Sony 200 to 600. And you put a, you put a, 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 a uh, uh, with the Sony cameras, you put a, uh, an extender on them and uh, you can also use the crop factor in the camera and you can get it up over 1100 millimeters. So you can get pretty close. Mm -hmm. You like your mirrorless because I've thought about going mirrorless. I love it. I love it. It's lighter, you know, as we travel around the world and try to, you know, the, the older you mm -hmm. get, the harder it is to get a heavy camera bag into the overheads and, you know, make sure you got space for it and so on. And, and even, you know, we could carry a one to four and a two to six and mm -hmm. two camera bodies and, uh, uh, and uh, sh shorter lenses, flash attachments and everything in one camera bag. And it's not too heavy. So that's, there's a real advantage to it. Well, there was um, one area that you seem to miss out and that's Europe. Why is that? Europe doesn't have that, uh, uh, you know, not enough there to attract us to go, I guess. Uh, you know, you go up in the Alps and you, there's some uh, endangered species up there, the, the, uh, the goats uh, in, in the Alps and a few others, but uh, uh, it's, yeah, we have been in Finland. Norway. And, we, and Norway, both. Um, but in Scotland. The, 
you know, Scotland. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but again, when I, if I was to include near threatened species, I would have things from Finland, Norway, and Scotland. Uh, but uh, uh, not, uh, uh, there's not that many things that are actually endangered there, I don't think, anymore. That, that you can photograph easily, but get to. It's a lot of effort. Russia is another case in point, but we haven't photographed there either. So we're not going to. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're not going to the Middle East either. We're, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're going to let, let that sort itself out. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. China. China's one that, you know, is intriguing, but. I'm not terribly inclined to go there right now. So yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Anyone else have a question? Where's your next uh, visit plan to be? I think we're going to go south about ten miles. <laughs> 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 or maybe west. I we just yeah. have to think about it. <laughs> Yeah, I'll tell you, this last year has really been bad because we had all kinds of trips planned we, and they had to, you know, cancel them all or postpone them all or whatever. And uh, we just don't know what's going to happen this year yet. It's with the, the virus, the mutants going around, even though we have our vaccines. Uh, I just don't think it's going to be very safe to travel for a while. Yeah. Sadly. Yes. And of course, the Super Bowl tomorrow is going to be, we're going to see Florida probably with an explosion of numbers again after all the Super Bowl parties. And uh, I don't know, <laughs> a little depressing. So where's the best place down around um, Pasco to see? Is it the Bachman sparrows at Starkey? Or what sparrow that's... That's Starkey. Ask, ask Christine. Yeah. Yes, you can find the Bachman Sparrow at Starkey, but you have to go out on the bike trail. Mm -hmm. um, or I couldn't further find south. it. Uh, next time you come, we'll hook you up with Joe Colantonio. Okay. He is the uh, I think actually Pamela Graber, who's on the on with us now. Pamela, where would you say to go? When I've seen P the Bachman Sparrow, it's been all the way out. Mm -hmm. The power lines out to the pump station in the um, in the Salt Palmetto out there, but Pamela may know of other areas. Do you? Where is Pamela? Pamela. Um, yeah, I heard one. So I went uh, way out, like it would be south of south. Well, wherever I went on the Christmas bird count, you have to ask Joe where I went. Uh, <laughs> It, it's way out there. It's probably a four mile hike um, starting at the uh, corral and then mm -hmm. going out past the bird blind and then just kind of keep going. But um, I think, you, you know, they're easier to see in spring when they're singing and in um, up in Hernando at uh, at the, what is that? Where the, where the red cockaded are, there's tons of Bachman sparrows there. So, I mean, they're more rare in Starkey Park, I think. But maybe what we can do when you're here is uh, if I'm, when we know when you're coming, we'll try and organize maybe for a few of us to go out there um, okay. and see if we can find the Bachman Sparrows and uh, the Northern Bob White and a, yeah. a few other birds that are- I missed there. that last time, yeah. Yeah, I'm here the first two Saturdays in May, so. And, and Gail is the president of uh, Hemong Valley Audubon in New York. Mm -hmm. Count me in if you will, when you go, please. Who's this? Mitch. Mitch, okay. Count me in if you go, when you go, please. Okay, we will do. We'll try and get you out Thank there. Thank you, okay. Matt. So how can we take these images and these trips and parlay them into affecting change? That's a very good question. And, you know, I mean, I, it's sort of like, you know, right now, I think I'm preaching, you know, we're, Nancy and I are preaching to the converted here, you know, but what would be nice is if people around the world could see, you know, 
pictures like this and understand what they represent. And, uh, you know, you sort of chip away at it, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, if, yeah, it, you know, in, 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 the, in the bigger picture, I think the bottom line is women's empowerment. And, you know, if you, I mean, I know Africa pretty well, and uh, Harvey, you could back me up on this one, but uh, uh, I think the problem is people still like, like we did in, the, in, in our country, your grandparents probably, or great grandparents anyway, came from families that were very large, you know, eight or 10 kids and that kind of thing. I mean, I've, I've just discovered that through working on genealogy this past year. And uh, the same thing is happening today uh, in the developing world, particularly like uh, around Africa. And people are having 10 kids still. And they expect five of them or six of them to not make it past age five or six. It's just statistically, that's the way it's always been. So, uh, I mean, there were places in Ivory Coast that we lived there years ago that uh, uh, they never even named the kids until they were five or six years old because they didn't expect them to live. And what we've done with modern medicine and feeding programs and save the children and all that stuff, you know, we all these kids live. <laughs> And this has been going on for a few generations now. And, uh, you know, the generation being 20 years. And so, and they're having 10 kids and it just is multiplying. And it, it, it's, it's their patriarchal societies. Uh, people don't know about, you know, women don't know that, you know, they have a, they have a, a possibility of limiting the number of children uh, and they aren't expected to do anything besides have children, that kind of thing. So. It's a cultural change. It's a cultural shift that, ha that has to happen. And uh, uh, we haven't, uh, our, you know, anybody's foreign aid programs or anything like that don't touch something like that because of the, the religious and other, uh, you know, uh, uh, implications of it all. It's interesting you took the conversation that way because, you know, I've, I've read more than once that ecologically the biggest bang for your buck is to invest it in making birth control available to limit population growth. Yeah, I know. I mean, I, I'd agree. I'd, I'd fully agree with that, but uh, uh, <laughs> try to sell that one. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. I know I went to um, Southeast Asia uh, two years ago now, and I own Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Everybody's eating the birds there's not enough food. So you don't see as many birds mm -hmm. there. I didn't get up in any of the jungle. You know, I was along the coast and whatnot. I wasn't on a birding trip. I was on a cruise. And Thailand, I saw some birds. But you know, North America, you see a lot more birds than a lot of places. Um, China, China also, um, you know, birds on a barbecue stick. Um, yeah. Yeah, and um, oh, geez, um, what is it um, that nets the birds from Europe? Cyprus, no, that nets the birds that migrate from Europe to uh, Africa every yeah, year. Yeah, yeah, Malta and Cyprus. Yeah, they, or Malta, I think it is. Yeah, yeah they they mm -hmm. collect as many little birds they can and put them on a barbecue stick. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, and the birds in China, in particular, we noticed even little chickadee-sized birds are very wary of humans uh -huh. um, and, um, and very difficult to photo, photograph. And, and more than once we were taken to a place that was known for a particular species and we found out that had been eaten, eaten to local extinction. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. <laughs> it, it, yeah. And they were, I mean, I actually have a photograph of somebody up in northern along the coast in um northern vietnam they were collecting um they had birds nest stew or soup oh that that's another yeah disgusting. Sorry, yeah so they were collecting yeah, yeah, they were collecting the judge, nest. but i don't know how you can call that food yeah, uh, yeah but yeah, i mean so a... that does away with the nest yeah exactly exactly we so, were in a, they were in a cave where they were allowed to collect yeah. and it 
it is truly hard to call that food in, in yeah. any mm -hmm. sense of the nutrition. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so so much of it is so cultural. Yes, it is. In yeah. uh, uh, the days of Mao Zedong in, in China, uh, when the, he was having his you know great leap forward in the culture uh, and uh, uh, trying to uh, collectivize agriculture, they had enormous crop failures. Well, he couldn't blame that on, on government policy. Uh, so he said it was the birds and he urged people to go out and kill birds and eat them. Uh, and uh, uh, I mean, it was basically, it was bad policy that led to crop failures, the collectivization of farms. And uh, so birds in China are, are sparse and, and wary mm -hmm. and, and so on. We, we did bird in Southern China once. So, yeah. No, we did the same thing here. I mean, when I was young in my back in the 50s, when I was a kid, you know, farmers shot the raptors. Well, and what happened to the Carolina parakeet? Yeah. Um, well, look at the carrier. Was it the carrier pigeon? Yes. Yeah. Carrier pigeon, Carolina parakeet. Yeah. yeah. Hawk Mountain in Pennsylvania was bought by a fairly wealthy woman from New York. Uh, for the sole purpose of stopping the killing of raptors. Uh -huh. Right. When she walked onto the site after she'd signed all the papers, the local people had raptors hanging from, dead raptors hanging from, uh, not trees, from, from fences, just to show her who I they were. Okay. Hawk Mountains in Eastern Pennsylvania, uh, yeah. near Al uh, Allentown. Beautiful place in the fall. Absolutely gorgeous because it's the eastern edge of the Kittatinny Mountains and the young birds use the mountains and the um, rising air to come down. The more experienced birds use the coast, but it's a great place in the fall. There's a couple places up, one on, two on Lake Ontario that are good raptor play derby hill and then the other one is up above braddock bay which i've been to braddock bay and that's amazing when the raptors are going through wow though the, i like your photographs i photograph birds also thank you yeah. so that's why i was asking about the mirrorless camera because oh. my my camera's a canon mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, I'd love to try a mirrorless and see how it, Canon has some new ones out. I hear the R5 is uh, outstanding. Okay. But they don't work, they don't work with your lenses. That's, you gotta. <laughs> That's it. I know. <laughs> That's what I understand. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess you can get an adapter, but you have to do a manual focus. Yeah. Ah, uh, there is some some issues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you so you much. We look forward to Bye. seeing you next month. And uh, thanks to everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Chuck and Nancy. Thank, Thank you. you for hosting. Hmm. Take care. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Yeah, we this is amazing. <laughs>